I'm Dr. Greg Harrison. Thank you for this opportunity to share my experience of the rehabilitation of injured wildlife and the influence of organic farming. I've learned since veterinary school, very slowly it seems, that after 30 years of working with organic farmers, purchasing my own organic farm, that there's something going on in wildlife that are injured, that it's not just hitting a tower. Why do they hit a tower? And I think we'll go through the steps together so that we can see together. This is a message that needs to get out to the world, not just about injured wildlife, but about the world in general. I'm dedicating this talk not only to injured wildlife, but to you, the audience, and the next six, seven generations of your grandchildren and children, because I think we've got a message here that encourages us to look beyond just what's going on with birds. And I'd like to thank my wife for encouraging me to go beyond what's just affecting wildlife. And you've seen in my bio who Greg Harrison is. I thought I would just give you a few quick slides to show you how I got involved in this and, and why it's become so important to me. And one of the things was um, when I was doing injured eagles, it didn't really occur to me to do deeper diagnostics that this bird had been injured and that's all I was looking at. I wasn't looking at any other deeper causes. And one of the things I'm sure I wasn't aware of was did this bird survive because it was such a minor injury that the bird was able to be released without a lot of work so it's possible that we released a bird that wasn't ready to be released. I lived in a small Iowa town and I helped the farmers uh, take the grain and run it through a thrashing machine and uh, my job was quite intense. I carried water on a pony out to those farmers. Here's a picture I did uh, when I first got in practice and I had some spare time. I was remembering what it was like on my grandfather's farm. And this is my uncle milking a cow. And the difference between this farm and a farm of today is it would be hundreds or thousands of cows and hundreds or tens of people doing the milking. In those days the cream was the, was the goal. And the cream would be separated in a little room in the back of the barn. And that would be taken to town and sold for ice cream and butter and the milk would be given to pigs or people on the farm that needed some milk. And my other experience was that my father had a real passion for wildlife and and he took my sisters and I hunting but you'll see in this picture another thing that was his real passion and that was birdhouses. And above my sister's head there is the Greg, Barbara and Beverly Lines, a little boat that he named after us and it had about 20 little martin houses in it and he used to make martin houses for people all over the the county some of the other early influences that i worked for a veterinarian as a young boy shoveling snow then i went into his office and helped him remove labels from his bottles so he could recycle them well this doctor had had polio when he was younger and he needed someone to help him drive his car and he needed someone to carry his tools when he did his work and during the 20 years that I worked with him not one time did I ever recall having a person bring in an injured wildlife and I wonder why that is well, we dealt mainly with cattle and pigs but there had to be injured wildlife what happened to them were they shot and killed or um, people just didn't cherish them, I'm not sure what the answer is. When I went to veterinary school, my botany instructor turned his class into the most recent best-selling book called Silent Spring. It was a book by Rachel Carson who was telling us it's time to do something about DDT. Not only was it causing all other kinds of disasters, it was softening the shells of eagles, peregrine falcons, and pelicans and her prediction was in the future we would have no songbirds. She participated in congressional hearings, she was considered a kook, and she died of breast cancer. And an interesting movie I would suggest that anyone who wants to know more about Rachel Carson and, the, and these issues is called Rachel's Daughters. And it showed what happened with other women in the Massachusetts area where Rachel used to live and how many of them came down with breast cancer. And one of the researchers they interviewed showed that in 
producing a cell line of breast cancer cells by adding a small uh, soft rubber plastic pipe by mistake a researcher was able to produce many more cancer cells than anyone else so it opened their eyes to the effect of soft plastics on our bodies. I then was lucky enough to get to work with a gentleman named Cliff Affinger and we worked with the Everglades Audubon Society to set aside 30% of Palm Beach County for parks and recreational areas and I, and I learned why that might be so important. Then I had the experience in the 70s of working with a lady named Doris Mager. She's currently 84 years old and still puts on her uh, displays about injured birds. And in 1979, she sat in an eagle's nest for seven days and six nights to bring the plight of, of eagles to the American public. She founded an organization called SOAR, Save Our American Raptors. Check her name out on Google and, and YouTube, and it's really quite interesting what she's still doing. I also worked with Bonnie Finley, and Bonnie had the Bambi Wildlife Sanctuary, later became the Falk Peterson Rehab Center, which I think has been closed down. But one Easter in 1978, she had about 300 birds in her care. A lot of them were young baby birds. The volunteers had taken the holiday off, and she was asleep in her chair when I arrived, exhausted. Dozens of her little baby birds had starved to death, and the Florida Fish and Game came in and shut her down. But Bonnie took her care, her birds' care, out into the woods where no one could watch what she was doing, and no one could say no to her at that point because they couldn't prove what she was doing. But it just showed me what a um, an, an obsessive personality Bonnie had, and was she really doing the best for the birds? And, and there's no way that, that she could have been doing what was best for the birds, but she thought she was. Then, in uh, 1972, the Hooker Chemical Company had convinced the Florida Department of um, Environment that it, we had a real bad problem. We had fire ants. And just like DDT, they wanted to bomb the state of Florida with a chemical called Myrex. There had been a, a few cattle... Um, especially babies attacked by fire ants and died, and there had been a couple people badly stung. And the people were all in arms about this very dangerous ant. The safety of this chemical had not been studied, but its effectiveness against fire ants certainly had. But because of its known carcinogenicity and uh, the other biological toxins it had, it was an environmental uh, pollutant that stayed in the environment like DDT. We were able to actually prevent its use. Well then, let's look at some of the mistakes farming has made in, in our culture over the last few hundred years. And one of the first disasters was called mono-agriculture. This happened, for example, with potatoes in the 18, late 1800s and in wheat in the United States in the uh, mid-1900s. And what happened in Ireland was the potato famine. This is a mold that can even be caused by bacteria and it was because the Irish people had planted only one kind of potato, they quit planting the multiple varieties they had because they could plant one that gave huge production. They all went to one type of potato and used it over and over again on land that was marginal and they ended up with a very weak um, potato when it came to resistance to disease. It got the potato blight in um, 1845 and over the next seven years uh, one million people in Ireland died. Well, we made a similar mistake then in the 1930s, and that's the Dust Bowl. The farmers moving west decided that the cash crop of the day, the thing that was really needed, was wheat, and every square inch of the prairie was turned over and areas drained uh, to make way for wheat. Uh, they stopped the old traditional things of crop rotation and they let the fields set empty f over the winter and there was a lot of um, loss of moisture there was wind erosion and then they had a, a drought and what happened was the Dust Bowl and the Dust Bowl people um, lived in these little shacks that the dust could go right through the boards of the shack they wrapped their heads in sheets poured water over their heads because they didn't have cars and planes and things they couldn't leave their their homes 
and a lot of those people died or starved to death. Um, it was just a, a, an amazing disaster. Well, it happened because when you monocrop, as they've learned with potatoes, the soil loses its ability to respond to its natural uh, behavior. So holding moisture and supporting the growth of things can be lost if, you, if you're not careful. The soil becomes dry and hard. Uh, it doesn't retain water. And the reason is those little micro community of organisms that build soil die. Worms, beneficial insects, and an organism called mycorrhiza. It's a, basically a little um, fungus-like organism, a beneficial one, that um, allows the soil to share its benefits with the fungus and the fungus with plants. It's a very symbiotic relationship and all these things are lost due to monocropping. So this dry hard soil and, and lack of mycorrhizal community led to the Dust Bowl. And the Dust Bowl was uh, written about in a lot of things, but one man responded to it, and that was Aldo Leopold. In his book, The Sand County Almanac, he had just retired as a U.S. Forest Service uh, director where he had created, created the first designated wilderness area in the United States and was becoming um, to Wisconsin to be a professor of forestry in 1934. He went out and saw the disaster to the farmland around the university and in 1935 he purchased 120 acres of land. Over the next uh, 40 years he planted 48,000 trees on that 120 acres. And his book, The Sand County Almanac, is a bible for the restoration of ecology and stewardship. Well, here's a picture of his daughter sitting on the fence in 1936 when he had just purchased this land. And it's basically, if it was in better color, you could see that there was just nothing growing there. And this was a year-round phenomenon. Nothing grew. Weeds didn't grow. Nothing. And 40 years later, Leopold had created this beautiful forest with trees and bushes and shrubs. But the point is, it took 40 years to restore that, restore that land and it's still not farm quality land. This is the little shack that he wrote the, the book in uh, back in the 36 and again 2001 and these are still available today up the Leopold Center in um, Wisconsin. So I'm, what I'm wondering is if we're repeating this history not only with um, the, the mistakes of the way we're treating the land but also the chemicals, the way we're treating the, the environment in total. And most of this is due to mega-agriculture. So what is mega-agriculture? Well, basically, it's huge companies making a lot of money off the backs of farmers. Um, most of the things on this list, equipment, chemicals, seeds, and energy supplies, started out being fairly inexpensive, but now they're all very expensive. For example, GMO seed corn, when uh, Mr. Garst showed seed corn to Nikita Khrushchev in Iowa in the 1960s. He was selling his seed corn for $9 a bushel. Today it's $200 a bushel and it, can't, and it's, it may go over that very shortly. And you could buy um, corn that would um, produce, and currently you can buy this corn for the $200 bushel that will produce two to 400 bushels per acre of corn. That's the F1, the first crossing of the hybrid. But if you save those seeds and plant the F2, it'll only produce 25 bushels to the acre. So they've programmed into the seed a disaster for anybody that keeps it. And that's what happened in Africa. They took these principles of farming there, gave them GMO corn, they couldn't afford the chemicals, they couldn't afford the seed, so they kept the seed and they almost starved to death producing only 25 bushels to the acre but since they didn't have the chemicals they may have produced a lot less. Recently because of the downturn in the economy the actual chemical costs in 2010 were reduced as much as 50 percent but before that um, some of these chemicals were selling for twenty dollars a gallon so they're, they're down to ten now but fertilizer has continued to go up and is costing as much as a thousand dollars a ton uh, but that again is an oil-based product 
and they expected that to go down uh, because farmers weren't using as much of it. But energy prices in general, the cost of running a tractor over the land has gone up 15 percent. Here's an example of my grandfather's farm, a, a painting that shows that there are trees and shrubs and fence rows and, and grasslands around the roads. Well, those are things that are, that are no longer available around most farms. In fact, this particular farm has been leveled and it's now um, just producing corn. This is my cousins and I on my grandfather's tractor, a 60 horsepower hand crank version that um, couldn't pull more than three or four rows of crop treatment equipment at a time and a truck in the background that probably held um, maybe a hundred bushel of corn at a time. But my grandfather was going through a transition as most Iowa farmers were in the 50s and they decided that they needed more corn and more soybeans. And the way they did that was they started to make the same monocropping disaster experience in it five years, six years of that, they started to have an explosion of a pest called the corn borer. And out came the chemical companies saying that they had the answer to this and that was to drop DDT by planes over the crops. I was unlucky enough to be able to be asked by my grandfather to stand at the end of the road so the plane knew where he had sprayed when he made his turns. So I'm not sure what all those effects on me were but I don't think they were good. To have this mega agriculture you have to make the land confirm to this huge equipment and that means that if for example if you meet one of these huge pieces of equipment coming down a farm road you gotta back up into another farmers piece of property to let them buy because two of them can't pass on the road and what has happened is we went from one to two row machines in the thirties and forties um, to eight row uh, as we got machines involved, went from horses, then in the 60s and 70s they got 16 row and now they have 32 row wide machines that have to have flat land and uh, can't have fences and stuff blocking them when they turn around. Well the f wheat farmers actually had tried this originally. That There were wheat farmers that used 16 mules and one man drove them and one farmer I talked to he and his brother had 150 mules and horses that they worked their wheat farm. So they had tried this even with animals. And here's just a photographic example of what I'm talking about, starting with horses with a couple rows, a small tractor with two to four rows, a bigger tractor with four to eight rows, and then 16, 12, and then this monstrous machine that looks like a bulldozer, and then the one on the end there has um, Oh, 62 rows, something like that. Just incredible size changes. Well, not only did the size go up, the cost went up. And this harvester in the background here that's harvesting uh, weed or corn, that's a $250,000 machine. The tractor that's pulling the wagon is an $80,000 machine. And then we have a grain wagon that holds the grain. That's another $30,000. Other expenses that aren't shown in this picture are fuel, insurance, uh, these wagons go to the end of the field and are dumped into semi-trucks. Those semi-trucks are often owned by the farmer and then he takes those semi-trucks to an area where he stores this grain in bins that can cost from fifty to a hundred thousand dollars a piece. Not unusual for a farmer to have two to four of those bins. So you're talking millions of dollars in equipment to do farming today. And the only way farmers were able to do that is if they had government subsidy. So subsidies on corn and soybeans are being blamed for destroying modern farming, but most modern farmers think that's what's keeping it alive. And the farmer then feels he can get bigger and bigger because um, he's going to get the subsidy no matter what happens to the corn price. This subsidy all started with uh, President Dwight D. Eisenhower, Secretary of Agriculture, Ezra Taft Benson in 1953. He decided that this boom to bust farming wasn't the answer to, to massive production and they needed to subsidize the price of corn and soybeans so if they produced too much they still could make a living. And what has happened is we see farmers today with a thousand acres of farmland 
only producing $50,000 of, of gross income after you take all the expenses out. And then the government also is involved in crop insurance. So they've set it up so the farmer doesn't completely fall, fall apart financially, but he also doesn't make a lot of money. Well, what's driving this mega agriculture? Well, basically, it's those companies making all that money off of the cheap corn and soybeans and off of the farmer's back, and they're taking that cheap corn and turning it into up to 2,000 um, different products from one bushel of corn. And um, companies doing that are Monsanto, ConAgra, ADM, Kellogg's for their breakfast cereals, and a lot of pet foods. And we see here examples of things you'd never think of that have corn in them, from glues to mouthwashes to uh, syrups and jellies and jams and band-aids and paper towels. The number of things involving corn are endless. In 2011, we set a new record. In 2011, there was more corn fed to cars than to animals, and that's because of ethanol. And ethanol is what's behind the huge explosion of land values. In 2006, farmland was selling around three to four, five thousand dollars an acre, and now it's going up to fourteen thousand dollars an acre. And that land is leasing without the person who owns it having to do anything for three to four hundred dollars an acre. So you can start to do some of the math and see how does that guy making fifty thousand dollars a year gross pay for all these things. And there are a lot of people say that there is a land bubble, that their land can't keep going up in value. Well, they're probably correct, but only correct if ethanol subsidy is stopped. The effects of mega agriculture are that you have to change the land to, to be able to uh, comply to this huge instruments that you use to farm. And basically that's what's killing small agriculture. They eliminate the trees and the fences because that's not compatible with these huge flat lands they need. So they take out all the fence rows and the trees and things like that. And what happens then is we lose nest sites for insectivorous songbirds. So you have to use more pesticides to kill bugs. You lose the homes for the beneficial insects like wasps, bees, lacewings, ladybugs, and this insect here called the praying mantis. They eat um, the, the bad bugs and if you don't have homes for them then you need to use more pesticides. When I was in Nebraska this year um, I thought I saw a monarch butterfly um, caterpillar on the ground and I picked it up took this picture on the right and it was a moth um, baby and the picture of the moth is on the left and I started to find out what what was the name of it and a lot of information about it and I found out there are over 5,000 species of moths in the United States. And they're a major food source for bats, squirrels, ground squirrels, raccoons, badgers, and a lot of bird species. So they're a, a um, bellwether species and they're declining like crazy and, and not many people are really studying them. So there's a, another incidence that um, agriculture is having an impact on a, a food source. And the other thing that this flatland does is it allows water to run off and wind erosion. And when water runs off, it takes with it a lot of the chemicals and it doesn't go into the soil where it maintains its moisture. And if you want a lot of farmland, then you also need to get rid of land that holds water. So they take a lot of this water and dump it into rivers and lakes. And we do back pumping. And what happens when you use water that's been contaminated as a, a source of water for storage areas is eutrophication. And that's when the environment turns into a whole bunch of weeds, like in the Everglades, trees and cottontails, which are poor habitat for the, the animals. Well, the way you get water off of a very wet piece of land is called ditching or tiling. And here's a machine that has a wheel on it that's 10 feet deep, we can dig a hole 10 feet deep and lay a perforated plastic pipe down through a piece of farmland and you start high and go to low and it takes the water off the land. And here's an example of where they might have done that. They, they dig an area so the major water leaves 
a prairie pothole. A prairie pothole is an area where a glacier dug out and allowed water to collect. In Nebraska and, and some of the other areas like the Dakotas, oftentimes they don't get regular rains. They have these potholes that hold water and they're there for, for months. Well that's the source of the nesting sites for most of the ducks in the world. And they take the high areas and fill in the low areas and then put in these tiles to drain and you end up with land that can be farmed. Well what's happened is that used to be the nesting area for um, the, the Midwest duck population. And mu much of this land is being reclaimed for sunflower seeds. And sunflower seeds do not grow well in, even in drain damp soil. So they have to use a lot of fungicides and that's killing off the ducks. So there's been a decline of over 40% of Midwest ducks. And here's the ducks we're talking about. These are blue-winged teal, green-winged teal, and the red-headed duck. These are ducks that do not adapt to suburban locales. There are ducks like mallards and there are geese like the Canadian geese that have adopted to urban water areas, but I think they're not the normal wild goose and the, and the wild mallard. The wild type ducks that lived in the prairie pothole areas, their food sources and nesting sites were interrupted. And they, we know that because this is a group of animals that hunters are very interested in and they've been keeping track of the population. And this drain drained habitat magnifies the effects of, her, of herbicides and insecticides and it kills the microcrustacea, the little shrimp and the little crayfish that the baby ducks live on so the baby ducks die. And the other thing is that during the springtime when you plant that's the time you use the most pesticides so that's also the time when the baby ducks are born so the effects are even more magnified because of that. Well in addition to killing the the food for baby ducks, what else happens when you use pesticides? Well, farms, creeks, water runs off into major rivers like in Nebraska, the Platte. The Platte goes to the Missouri and the Missouri goes to the Mississippi. And what happens then is it collects in the Gulf of Mexico and it's created a dead zone. And each summer it explodes more and more and the zone is void of oxygen and it kills all the marine life there. It's now considered to be the size of the state of New Jersey and it's mainly caused by fertilizers but there's all those other chemicals in there too. And you can see the satellite picture here. The dark red is the most intensely affected areas. Let's take a look at the sources of contamination that are creating the dead zone. First of all there's the confinement raising of animals, mainly hogs and cattle and those oftentimes have runoff of manure that gets into lakes and streams and also they produce carbon dioxide that's creating um, global warming. There are feedlots with as many as 13,000 head of cattle in them in one uh, county in Kansas and that particular uh, feedlot flows directly into the Sharps Creek in McPherson County. Sharps Creek is listed by the EPA and the state of Kansas as an impaired water area and it's impaired by E. coli and fecal contamination solid levels. So they're monitoring these things but they're not doing anything about it. In addition to that it's the chemicals that come from fertilizers, herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, rodenticides, antibiotics, and parasiticides for, for the animals themselves. And the mentor that um, really woke me up to all this was Michael Pollan. And Michael started to look at monstrous agriculture and see what was happening. And he basically says it's destroying farmland, aquifers, wells, rivers, and oceans as a result of the runoff of all these chemicals that we've discussed. And Michael did a couple really interesting books that most of us should take a look at and one was called The Omnivore's Dilemma and that's where he followed a, a cow from its birth all the way through a feedlot and all the things that, it, that were involved in that. The next source of contamination is ammonia, anhydrous ammonia which is used 
to fertilize crops and supply nitrogen and it's made from oil. So therefore it's very expensive, but it's also toxic and kills a lot of the friendly things in the soil and doesn't bind with the soil very well. It'll do great as a fertilizer if it's used immediately, but it doesn't stay in the soil well. The other thing that's creating this huge overflow of chemicals is that the things we're treating are becoming resistant to those uh, by as much as 300 percent. Well that means you have to increase the use of those pesticides by 400 percent to stay ahead of it. And one of the sad things is that the beneficial insects live on the corners of, of uh, farms and, and in areas where they don't use high concentrations of these pesticides and they don't develop the resistance as fast as the target species and they're three times as susceptible to these pesticides as um, harmful bugs. The wide use of these chemicals is in controlling weeds and other areas in our society where we use fertilizers and insect control like yards, schools, both inside and out, golf courses, parks, water storage areas. And one of the interesting things is that we are trying as a country to control the use of these chemicals because of all the things that we've seen. But we've done it in our homes, not in our, in, in our general environment. So you can still use them on golf courses and you can still use them in agriculture. Well, one of the interesting things is the difference between the United States and Europe. And for example, in France, you can use one insecticide on crops in golf courses and in uh, Germany you can't use any. But look at the United States, insecticides alone you can use 16. So it just shows that we have a whole different attitude about um, pesticides than they do in other parts of the world. One of those uh, relationships that's increasing the uh, use of pesticides is GMO crops. Crops that are resistant to pesticides like GMO corn and as a result of a lot of this resistance, as we've talked about, they're using heavier and heavier applications, and they're now showing that there are reproductive disorders in food animals, and we know that, um, from what we've already talked about, that the soil organisms are inhibited by this. One of the interesting references, for those of you who want to do further reading, is the Wildlife Pesticide and People Conference Proceedings book from the Rachel Carson Council. It is a 1998 reference, but there's nothing that's any more up-to-date and more thorough. It's a $25 book, and it documents most of the stuff we're talking about here today. And I think after you read through the book and listen to what we're talking about, we just haven't taken Rachel Carson seriously, and I don't know exactly what it's going to take. I'm hoping that our education of ourselves and the people we are involved with will, will make a big change in this. One of the reasons we can't show the side effects of pesticides on uh, creatures like wild birds is exemplified in the wild bird mortality triangle. First of all, there's a group of birds that people observe having problems and they report those to the authorities and the authorities actually go out and confirm that. It's an extremely small number. Then there's observed phenomenon, reported phenomenon, but they decide not to spend the money to confirm it. Lastly, in the observed area are those that are observed, but no one reports what's going on. They just basically say, oh, there's a bird that's not right, and, and don't pay attention to it. But probably the largest area in wild bird mortality is those that are not observed. And why wouldn't you observe them? Well, per first of all, the low numbers of birds being observed is due to the fact that within studies that have been done, 92 percent of those birds that died were eaten by other creatures or scavenged within 24 hours. And as most people who've worked with poultry know, they decompose rather rapidly, so you only have a few hours after death to get any meaningful results from a carcass of a dead bird. And thirdly, uh, when a bird gets sick, they don't just stand out there and wait for somebody to find them, they usually hide so, so they don't get eaten, uh, and therefore they don't get observed. Now, oftentimes they head into their nests or their burrows, and they, they aren't examined for that reason. And one of the other problems is most of the things we're studying, they have now been able to 
block the long-term pesticides that hang in the environment, hang in the tissues for, for years. These new pesticides hang in, in, in the tissues for a short period of time. They're very volatile and, and they are, evaporate from the bodies and break down. Uh, because they're using such huge amounts, we still see the effect. Uh, but there's, it's not as easy to detect as something like DDT that takes years to break down. The other thing about uh, wild bird mortality is the people who are concerned about it and want to have studies done don't have the money to do it. And that's because you need to have an expert do the necropsy. You need to have an expert not only on birds but in the types of diseases you're looking at, in histopathology, and then you need to have very special chemical tests run with electrophoresis. This can run hundreds and actually up to thousands of dollars per bird. So if you have a large incidence, it's very, very costly and, and there doesn't seem to be the interest in funding those kinds of studies. Again, how difficult it is to prove harm. Well, what we're talking about is the effects of pesticides is primarily they act as hormones and they stimulate the body. One of the effects is an estrogen type effect and it changes the cells into a more feminine nature which can stimulate cancer, heart disease, and weight gain. There are three types of estrogens, those that are produced by the body and the cells, and for example the ovary in females, but even the adrenal gland in, in uh, men produces estrogen. And that's natural, it has a lot of useful purposes in the body. And then there are plants that act like estrogens, they're called phytoestrogens, and they can actually block uh, the estrogen sites on cells and if you're exposed to the next group, the chemical estrogens are called xenoestrogens. They can actually help, uh, phytoestrogens can help prevent that toxic effect. So what's happening is basically estrogen locks onto a cell and causes feminization. And phytoestrogen can block both the natural estrogen and the uh, xenoestrogen. So it's a protective mechanism. Well, we know not only is there a feminization effect in birds, there's also a loss of masculine, um, which I suppose you could call feminization. But the males lose their ability to do their ritual dances, their songs. Uh, females don't recognize what the male's doing or singing, and so therefore they don't bond, they don't mate. Another problem that's been uh, investigated by Kirk Clasing, University of California, is these birds have a tremendous amount of immunosuppression as a result of all these chemicals and that makes them more susceptible to viruses and bacteria and things like that and then the stress of migrating is why we oftentimes see more adult birds during migration. But most of the effects we see in birds is in the springtime when the pesticides are used at the highest levels we see infertility of males with the sperm not being produced if there are chicks produced, they're often weak and don't beg for their food, and then they'll starve to death. And when they start to get weak, the parents kind of realize there's something wrong with them, and the parents aren't exactly normal anyway, so they just go off and take care of themselves, and the chicks die. And despite the fact that the big birds no longer have the effects of DDT softening their eggs, the small passerine birds, the songbirds, still have a lot of egg problems with even today's pesticides. And of course if they're broken or cracked, they, they can't incubate them. But yet there's a lot of other problems. When a bird can't um, hunt correctly, it doesn't heat right, it doesn't have the right body temperatures, it doesn't feel like the eggs are normal or whatever, and they abandon their eggs more, more commonly. And a lightweight bird is not going to spend its energy incubating eggs. The other effects are on other types of behavior, and I am convinced as well as the University of Minnesota studies show that birds with all these chemical exposures are more prone to injuries, partially because they're hunting alongside the roadside, it's easier to find food there, but um, they, they have trouble hunting in other places because they don't have the coordination and energy. And a lot of them have trouble eating when they do find food, and they, and they don't feed their young right. And we're also documenting migratory problems. It's very unusual for a normal bird to run into windmills, windows, and wires and get hit by cars. A wild bird would never have done that and 
until just these last few years where this is very commonly reported and it's most likely got a lot to do with um, chemical in intervention and when they go in and find a thousand dead birds by the time they get the study done they, they don't find the chemicals so it's very frustrating to prove harm. Birds that are not acting right are an easy target to get shot so a lot of inexperienced hunters are able to shoot birds that, uh, that aren't normal. One of the first studies to show the effects of herbicides other than the duck hunters was the uh, British game bird conservation who studied the bird they like to hunt over there called the great partridge and they found that the herbicides used in uh, treating the native uh, crops in Britain were killing those, those birds off by killing mostly the insects. Well as a result of mad cow disease those hedges were uh, being taken out and the birds were decreasing in, in numbers but now they're starting to return because mad cow took cattle off the land and they're replacing those hedges but the reason they're replacing them is not for the birds it's because it raises the value of the property and people from London want to have a nice little farm and they they spend millions of dollars renovating 300 year old barns for a weekend getaway one of the more recent publications that you can turn to to see what we're talking about is that organic farms actually enhance the number of species on a, on a piece of property. Is an article in the Journal of Agriculture and Ecosystems and Environment, March 2011, where they studied the effects of farms with and without um, organic uh, practices. So farms with hardly any uh, landscape uh, trees and bushes and hedges and ones that are organic that had them and there was a tremendous richness in the organic farms. And we've been alluding to this fact. In Europe they have to prove a chemical is safe to use it or we have to prove it's harmful and you've just seen how difficult it is to prove that something's harmful. So that's why we're going to continue to have this problem unless we change our approach to stopping the use of chemicals if we even possibly suspect that they're not safe. The other thing that's happened and a very recent and alarming thing is that the GMO crops drastically increasing the use of glyphosate as we talked about and glyphosate mainly acts as an inhibitor of manganese which is a mineral that the plants use to stay strong and healthy and weeds are especially needy when it comes to manganese so if you inhibit them they'll die very easily. Well, the red flag was raised by a grain scientist from Purdue University in 2011 named Don Huber. Dr. Don Huber is a soil ecologist and he found that the chronic use of glyphosate produces crops or soil that's deficient in manganese and there's a tremendous effect that that's starting to have. The first thing he noticed is that there's a whole new group of diseases such as soybean rust that's appearing in these crops and so far they haven't found a way to stop it. He also showed that it increases the virulence of pathogens not only in plants but in animals and uh, it's starting to show up in other plants such as corn and soybeans and they're manganese deficient and they're producing animals that are manganese deficient and what happens in an animal that's manganese deficient is they become immunosuppressed they start to show uh, fertility problems and he's documented spontaneous abortion well Texas and Florida are two states that raise a lot of cattle not necessarily the way we eat them they put them on sub substandard pastures to get some size and age on them and then they ship them to feedlots but his warning is that this GMO alfalfa that we're just starting to put on the market is going to get into the wild grasses and that's going to be the end of raising animals on, on, on pasture. We won't have enough animals raised for people to eat meat. So he's really worried about that and he sent that letter to the Secretary of Agriculture. The other thing is that President Obama when he was first in office instituted a council on the studying of prevention of cancer. It was about a five or six year study. It's a phenomenal report and basically what it says 
is that there are pesticides approved by the Environmental uh, Protection Agency that contain ingredients that are toxic. Over 900 of those ingredients have been approved uh, for the use on foods, lawns, and, and all kinds of things. And they say, again, that the European method is what they want to adopt. They know it's causing uh, that it's not safe. They're having trouble and it'll take another 20 to 30 years to prove the harm. But they now know there's enough incidents that these chemicals initiate or promote cancer. They disrupt the immune system and the endocrine system and they can't wait any longer for people to stop using them. And what they're suggesting is that we start following organic farming. Well, what happens when you decide you're going to get into organic farming? You have to buy farmland that has not been organic and you have to convert it to organic. Well, that's a three-year period for chemicals that they know can be get, gotten out of the soil over uh, time to leave, but yet there are chemicals that were used in the early 30s and 40s like lindane that will be a hundred years before they get out of the soil. So even organic soils don't contain no chemicals. They, they all contain some of the old chemicals that were used on uh, agriculture. But they're now in such low levels that they're not harmful, but they're, they're not gone. Well, not only does it take three years to convert to a level that they'll certify as organic, it can take another five to fifteen years to get that soil to a level where it's producing enough crops to be financially successful. And my mentors are Dave and and Don Vetter out in Nebraska and, and they've shown us uh, what's involved in all this and that's why we decided to purchase an organic farm. And on that farm this year we show in this picture a, a rich growth of a cover crop on the right hand side and a bare field area where no cover crop or no fertilizer uh, was put. The cover crop without fertilizer and then this rich growth of of uh, cover crop. The difference is we used um, organically approved pig manure. So we, there has to be more done to the soil than just rotation of crops and stop using chemicals. You have to build it up with, with uh, organic nutrients. And what happens when you do that is that soil starts to hold water, becomes much more pliable, it takes less energy from the farm machinery to cultivate it, and um, it maintains that moist shape rather than packing down into a hard, dry shingle. And um, that's very important because the organisms that are there can move around and the roots can grow through it much easier. Well, the healthy soil consists of a micro community. That's worms, protozoa, insects, and the mycorrhiza. And the most foreign one to us is the mycorrhiza. The mycorrhiza is this little symbiotic plant that sends out miles and miles and miles of tubers that plants send their roots into. Well, they send their roots into them because there are minerals inside those fungal tubers that the uh, plant needs. Well, the fungus needs something too, and that's why they let the roots grow into them. It needs carbohydrates and things that come from the sun that the plant produces, so that's why it's a symbiotic relationship. But in good farm soil, if you don't have mycorrhiza, you don't get the benefits of the minerals and the moisture maintenance that you do with good farm soil. So like I said, it takes three years to transition to organic. But what happens during that time in addition to not being able to sell your crops organic is there's an explosion of the things that they use pesticides on, weeds, insects, and your production is extremely low. So you have to start bringing back in trees to stop erosion and bushes to have bugs to live in and insectivorous birds to live in. And the natural vegetation needs to start to grow around the perimeter of the field up to 30 feet wide to keep uh, these beneficial organisms there and prevent the drift of chemicals from a nearby farm. So an organic farm cannot use chemicals, artificial products to grow or prevent bugs, weeds. You have to have that buffer zone and you have to use crop rotation to, to inhibit the, the bugs and the weeds. And you cannot use GMO and there was a move at one time to use sludge which is a byproduct of human sewage disposal 
Um, they wanted that to be used on organic farms and, and they would not approve it. Basically, if a product says it's organic, it has to have the USDA organic seal on it. If it doesn't have that, they cannot claim that it's organic. And they have to follow not just the fact they claim it's organic and get the seal. That seal has is granted when there's a third party involved. And that third party does inspections on the type of seeds you use in the ground, how you... Uh, grow your buffer zone, how you control weeds, um, what type of nutrients you apply to the soil, all of that is documented by a third party. Then where you harvest it, where you store it, who you sell it to, how they handle it, do they use any type of bug products on the places where it's stored, all the way down the food chain this has to be documented to maintain that certified organic label. And one thing about organic farming is that it, the microbial community breaks down that nitrogen and holds it in the soil much better than the one that comes from oil which actually inhibits mycorrhiza and, and doesn't lock in the soil as well. Well here's what the soil looked like on our farm when we first bought it. It, it was like a rock. It was hard, dry, very compacted, it was brittle and shattered and it was like a shingle. It just let the water run off and you couldn't find any worms or anything live in it. At the end of three years we saw first frogs returning, a lot of butterflies returning, but our production was still lousy. So we're at five years we're starting to see some decent production. Well what can you do then to contribute to this uh, program of recovering our environment? I think you have to become educated and hopefully you've done that with this presentation. But it's very important that you realize that the American public is not educated in this area. They don't appreciate good science and they don't know the difference between good science and poor science. Uh, we actually have people in the United States just recently estimated that 40% of Americans believe in werewolves and 60% of them don't believe in global warming. So we need to be educated ourselves because I think most people involved in dealing with what we're talking about are educated people, but you need to be able to convey it to the people that come into your life and educate them that science and what we're talking about is serious, it's true, and you need to pass that education down. The next thing is actually purchase organic products so you can support that organic farmer. You use your dollars to vote for what you want to happen to the world. And as we saw, Organic seeds aren't, don't use pesticides, so if you're going to feed wild birds, you should feed organic seeds. Is that because it's going to help the wild birds you're feeding? Not necessarily. It's going to stop the decimation in the prairie potholes and the duck population and all the other wild animals that live in the, the three states and up into Canada that are being decimated by raising seeds in a traditional manner with all the pesticides. There's another movement that's really cool, and that's the Audubon Certified Golf Courses. I would suggest you look into that for golf courses in your area, for organic lawns, schools, parks, water storage. Get the government to stop using all these chemicals on our, our areas where our children play, where our water is stored. And with all the movement to save money, it's a lot simpler to let things go back to nature and not mow it and put chemicals on it all the time. In Florida, purchase organic sugar. They use owls to control rats rather than rodenticides. They flood the fields with and grow organic rice to control the bugs. So that's an, a very worthwhile cause to support. Purchase organic foods as much as possible. Get educated about the labels. Another interesting change from plastics, which is petrochemicals or similar to pesticides, is the change to plant-based uh, bottles and Dasani is one that now has a hundred percent recyclable plant-based bottle and that's something you can do to support it. The other part of your education that I would suggest you look at for reading labels and understanding advertisements and everything is the greenwashing that's going on. Greenwashing means that the party doing the greenwashing is trying to convey to you that something is natural or healthy when in fact it may not be. And an example of that is exterminators using the word natural. 
and ivermectin, mercury, lead, arsenic are all natural chemicals that can be used to exterminate but none of them are healthy for the environment or for people so don't get conned into believing everything is natural is good. In fact natural things are not organic oftentimes. When it comes to understanding the word natural, natural seeds are not organic and oftentimes that's because they're packaged with insecticides to prevent infection in the packaging while they're sitting on the pet store or in your home. And most of those were raised with insecticides, herbicides, and fungicides. So they're not organic, but yet they are natural. And natural just means that it, you've taken something that has been grown or produced by a live thing, and you can change it a thousand different ways and still call it natural. And a lot of those ways they've been changed are not, are not beneficial. Going back to President Obama's panel on cancer prevention, they make uh, suggestions that we stop using pesticides, that their danger has been grossly underestimated. Not only are there 900 toxic chemicals, there are 80,000 chemicals that have been uninvestigated uh, used in the United States. Many of them are not regulated. And children are the first, and animals, especially birds, are more vulnerable to these toxins. And they suggest in the President's panel that we choose foods, house and garden products, toys, the places where we live and, and play, uh, the medicines we use, the medical tests that we have done, expose children to the lowest level of toxins. Parents should avoid exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals if they're going to have children. So that again is, is avoid pesticides and drinking water that is uh, pure and safe which usually means uh, commercially bottled water that's labeled as drinking water or check into your sources of drinking water in your home. The number and the complexity of environmental car carcinogens are just so uh, overwhelming now that that's why the President's Council is taking this action to show us that our public health can't wait any longer for uh, final proof that there's harm, we have to prove they're safe, and that's why they say go to organic. I'd like to end this with a case that's being presented in the RSPCA in England. Uh, it's a case that uh, Michael Stanford did, um, and it's interesting to show what we don't know about environmental harm to animals, because the cause of this case uh, is unknown. Basically, he discovered metabolic bone disease in a native pigeon in, in um, England. And he originally started studying them because they did have bone problems, but it wasn't considered a major problem. Well, Dr. Stanford had studied in African gray parrots, and he knew that this was a major problem in African grays, and maybe the same thing was happening in these doves. So there were enough of them that about 8% showed bent beaks and, and bent limbs if you really got a hold of them and give them a real good exam, but that was much more obvious on x-ray. So Dr. Stanford x-rayed all the wood pigeons submitted in 2006. The year before, um, they had had 397 birds admitted and 120 actually got released from that group. Within the first 48 hours, 150 of them were euthanized because of problems they had. And 48 hours later, another 120 were euthanized. And what he found was, after doing these x-rays, not only were the 8% affected that the people who were doing the physical exams had discovered, there were actually 44% that had metabolic bone disease. So it was being missed by the people who examined the birds and he had to have um, radiographs to prove this. Well the treatment was to put them on um, UBV lights and put them on a good diet that contained uh, no pesticides and the number of birds that were released uh, jumped up to somewhere in the 90 percent range. So the bottom line is there's birds suffering from diseases in rehabilitation facilities that we don't know the cause we do know the cure, but this is another example of 
is something safe or is it harmful? We know there's something not safe going on around these animals, but we can't prove what's causing the harm. And I've got some uh, brochures available for anyone who's interested to support uh, the Rachel Carson Council that talks about the use of pesticides on golf courses. And I will be uh, offering these available for a matching gift fund. So if somebody wants to buy one for, say, a dollar, I'll match it. If there's any questions, get a hold of us at www.heal-x.com. Thank you for your attention.